everybody. Uh, this week we will be looking at two final methods of second language instruction. The first, cognitive code, is not actually a method per se, but it is a philosophical approach that uh, has some seeds of activities that can be done to enhance language learning. And task-based language learning, which is not just a method, but is a whole range of uh, different things that can be applied using different tasks to study language. When I was first starting to think about teaching as a career, uh, I read the requisite uh, collection of books for people who were into educational reform at the time. Uh, Summerhill, which is about a private school in England, a boarding school that uses a rather radical approach to allowing students to make pretty much all of their own decisions. Uh, 36 Children by Herbert Cole. Uh, that was his memoir of a year of teaching uh, children in an inner city school and all the problems that were attendant to that and how he solved those. Um, Education and Ecstasy by George Leonard, which is kind of a visionary work in that it envisions what education can be. And uh, most important of all, Teaching as a Subversive Activity by Neil Postman and Charles Weingartner. Interestingly enough, with the exception of Summerhill, I still have all of these books on my education shelf. Postman and Weingartner wrote a whole bunch of different books over their career. Uh, teaching as a subversive activity is probably the one they're best known for. But I came across this little book called Linguistics. Uh, I came across it in my local library shortly after I'd moved to New Jersey. At the time, I was teaching in a variety of different Hebrew schools. I was teaching Hebrew in all of them and trying to figure out how to integrate Hebrew language into the traditional curriculum of the schools. And this little book was really influential in my thinking about that. Uh, it described how first language English grammar could be taught using a constructivist approach. What they said was that linguistics is the application of the scientific method to language. It's how scientists study a language. And they laid out a whole series of different kinds of activities that could be used to teach first language grammar to students who are English speakers. But as I read the book, it became very clear to me that the approach they were using was similar to what I had done in my first year linguistics class at the university. This is how linguists working in the field with a language that nobody knows, this is how they figure out the code for how that language works. And I began applying this to Hebrew teaching in supplementary schools. And I've developed a series of different activities using this kind of approach that I've used uh, for many, many years and have actually included in some of the books I've published. I have a couple of samples uh, of that in this week's lesson. Uh, what I didn't know at the time was that Postman and Weingartner's work was really based on what has now come to be known as the cognitive code approach. The cognitive code approach, because it's not really a method, it's more of a philosophical approach, has its roots in the 60s, uh, and it really took on full-fledged development in the 1970s. It was really promoted by two leading researchers, John Carroll and Kenneth Chastain. Carroll was an educational psychologist, and interestingly enough, he was actually a student of B.F. Skinner's, but he left Skinner to pursue um, psychometrics, which is analysis, assessment and, and testing, uh, something that Skinner was totally not interested in. 
And Carroll became a major opponent, actually, of Skinner's audiolingual approach. He grew to specialize in the psychology of linguistics and of language learning. Kenneth Chastain was a structural, structural linguist. The structural linguistics looks at language as uh, interlocking systems, structural systems, a phonological system, a word building system, a semantic system, and so on. Uh, so the two of them really were primed for the cognitive code approach because it was a way of bringing grammar back into the study of language. The grammar translation method had proven to be pretty dull and ineffective. The audiolingual method was a reaction against it. Cognitive code was kind of a counter reaction against audiolingualism. It did not develop into a full method, and there were a lot of reasons that that happened, uh, mostly that the, the, the predominant method, uh, communicative method, which we studied last week, that emerged on the scene at about the same time uh, that uh, Carol and Chastain were advocating for the cognitive code approach. Um, Postman and Weingartner really showed how this kind of approach could be used to teach first language learners how to process English, and it could certainly be applied to second language learning as well. Um, and it's very reminiscent of those linguistics exercises that I had when I was a student working on my BA. About the same time that this was all happening with uh, Carol and Chastain's work on the cognitive code method, uh, the researchers began looking at the question of which method is the best method for teaching a language. And it's worth noting that all teachers have their own particular preferences. Uh, they have their own theories for how language acquisition happens. They have their own preference of methodology, types of activities that they use, how they run their classrooms. This is something that is still very much present today, uh, as evidenced by the research of Schwarzer and Bloom. Uh, every teacher just has their own way of thinking about it. And the researchers in the 60s, 70s, and 80s started testing students who were learning using different methodologies. They would test Spanish one students uh, who were learning via grammar translation and test another group that was learning through the audiolingual method. And they compared the results of the tests. And what they found was that uh, students were not really learning anything. They were not really learning full language uh, proficiency with any method, and that the results were really quite similar uh, between the two different methods. It is true that those that were focused on oral production were better at speaking, slightly, and those that focused on grammar were better at grammatical exercises, but none of them were really becoming proficient in language learning. And as a result of these kinds of studies, a whole new set of theories about second language acquisition began to develop. Uh, one of those that I'm particularly fond of is the neurofunctional theory. This was started by John Lamandella, uh, and its other major proponent was Larry Selinker, whom you read about in week three. He is the person who came up with the concept of interlanguage. Basically, the neurofunctional theory looks at the interplay between language and the brain. How is language processed in the brain? How is it produced in the brain? And it really looks at two central issues. One is uh, has to do with the language centers, Broca's and Wernicke's areas, which are in the left cerebral hemisphere. And the other major area that this particular theory looks at is the role of the right cerebral hemisphere. Now, Lamandella was writing in the 60s when there was 
not a whole lot of interesting ways of studying the brain, not, not a whole lot of safe ways of doing it. And now with neuroimaging technology, uh, this particular field is really taking off in some pretty interesting ways, but the, the basics are still the same. So to understand this, we need to know a little bit about the human brain. So I'm going to take you on a quick romp through uh, the, uh, the brain and especially the brain as it's related to language. So on the left side of the screen, you see uh, a color-coded collection of the different lobes in the cerebral cortex. Uh, the red indicates the frontal lobes. Those are, that's the area that is responsible for cognitive functioning, executive decision-making, planning, understanding consequences, and so on. Uh, the blue area is the parietal lobe, which is mostly responsible for sensory uh, information and movement. Uh, the one sense that is not located there is the sense of smell, which is buried deep inside uh, the brain as part of the limbic system, which controls emotions. That's an interesting uh, phenomenon, but uh, not quite germane here. The green is the occipital lobe. That is where vision takes place. Underneath that is the cerebellum. Cerebellum means little brain, and it looks a whole lot like a brain in miniature. The cerebellum is responsible for balance. It's how we learn to walk and coordinate our body. Uh, and it is also, interestingly enough, uh, playing a significant role in coordinating the different skills necessary to read. Underneath that, uh, the purple is the brain stem, which is responsible for all of our autonomic nervous system. It's our heartbeat, our breathing, digestion, and so on. And in the gold is my favorite area, the temporal lobe. In the left hemisphere of most people, this is the area responsible for language. In the right hemisphere, in most people, it's responsible for music, which is kind of interesting. Now, within the temporal lobe, there are two main areas. Uh, one is known as Broca's area. This is uh, an area that was discovered or identified in 1861 by a French surgeon and anatomist named Paul Broca. He was working with a patient who could only say tan, tan. It's the only vocalization he could make. And this was the result of, of uh, a stroke. Uh, subsequently, the patient passed away and Broca conducted an autopsy of Tan's brain. And he found that there was damage to this one small area in the left cerebral cortex. Based on this one case, Broca theorized that this area was responsible for the production of language, and that was confirmed by subsequent autopsies of other aphasics, uh, and it's been known as Broca's area ever since. A decade later, a German neurologist named Karl Wernicke, uh, also working with a stroke patient, identified the area responsible for understanding and generating meaningful language. It's located right behind the left ear and it's called Wernicke's area. Um, so neuro, the neurofunctional theory, the theorists, look at those two areas uh, as uh, part of what they study. In addition, uh, something you should know about the cerebral cortex, is that it has two hemispheres. They're roughly equal in size, but not at all in function. Uh, they're connected by a thick bundle of nerves, uh, indicated here in red. Uh, that is known as the corpus callosum. Uh, the corpus callosum contains up to upwards of 200 million nerve fibers, and it transmits several billion bits of information per second between the two cerebral hemispheres. Uh, it's what allows the brain to make incredible connections between different pieces of information, different kinds of information. But in severe epileptics, it can also 
allow grand mal seizures to move from one side of the brain and trigger them in the other side, resulting in virtually continuous seizures. So as a last ditch effort to control the seizuring, um, neurosurgeons in the late 50s started performing a surgery where they would physically sever the entire corpus callosum. This is known as a total callosotomy. They hoped that this would stop the seizures, and in fact it did. Uh, a dramatic decrease in the frequency and intensity of the seizures uh, for these people who were suffering. But it also produced some rather odd side effects. Um, for one thing, uh, patients started to report that they were experiencing some kind of strange things. Some found that it was tough to select the clothing that they were going to wear from their closets or to choose items from a shelf in a grocery store. Their hands would actually fight each other as they would reach out for an item uh, that they were trying to, to collect. It was literally as if their right hands did not know what their left hands were doing. So in a series of studies that won him the Nobel Prize in 1982 for uh, medicine, Roger Sperry, pictured on the right, collecting his Nobel Prize, uh, Sperry and his colleagues at the California Institute of Sec Technology set up a series of experiments to discover what processes were occurring in these so-called split brain patients. Um, they conducted a set of, of really interesting experiments where they would present different stimuli to the two different hemispheres. So for example, when people look at something on the right, they use the right visual field. When they look at something on the left, they employ the left visual field. Uh, but because of the way the brain is wired, it's kind of cross-wired, images from the right visual field are processed in the left hemisphere. Images from the left visual field are processed in the right hemisphere. And that same thing happens, that same cross-wiring happens with our arms and legs. So what we touch with our right hand is processed in the left hemisphere. What's felt with the left hand is processed in the right. So in one experiment, uh, patients were shown two different words, one in the left hemisphere and one in the right. And they were then asked to say what it was they had seen. And when they were asked what word they had seen, the patients would say ring. But when they were asked to select an item from an assortment hidden behind the screen, uh, to ask to choose one with their left hand, they invariably chose key because that is what the right hemisphere had seen. And the right hemisphere controlling their left hand reached for the key, whereas the language center in the left hemisphere had seen what was on the right and had said that what they saw was a ring. Uh, there were all sorts of experiments uh, like this that were conducted by Sperry and his colleagues and they were able to identify certain qualities about the left hemisphere that are different from the right. So for example, the left hemisphere tends to be very analytic. It's where math and language take place. The right hemisphere is far more holistic. So how does this apply to language learning? Well, Lamandella and his colleagues were able to identify the notion that certain chunks of language, especially early on in the language process, they're, they're learned as unanalyzed chunks, and they tend to be learned by the right hemisphere. So for example, this is why you, know, you, you hear someone say, how are you? And there's an automatic kind of quick response. It's because that response was learned as an unanalyzed whole. Uh, same thing with allow me to introduce, nice to meet you, please, thank you, you're welcome. These are all unanalyzed chunks, both for first language learners and for second language learners. And where it 
concerns us with Hebrew for second language learners, you hear the, the phrase ma'anyanim, right? People will ask you ma'anyanim. And that has been something that learners tend to learn as a chunk. They don't understand that inyan is the root of this, which is related to me'anyen. And maha inyanim literally means what are the interests? Basically means what's happening, what's going on, what's new. And it's and it's stored that way. It's stored as a question of what's happening, how are things, how are you, rather than actually specifically analyzing it into its part. So one of the researchers that has been involved with the neurolinguistic, uh, neurofunctional theory of linguistics is a gentleman named Herbert Seliger. Um, Seliger actually talked about why it is that learners can be in a classroom, they can drill a concept either in writing or orally, but when they are removed from the immediate context, why is it that they have difficulty with, with, the, um, with the item? And the theory is that when it's learned inductively, grammar and pattern drills, both oral and written, are processed by the right hemisphere. This would make sense. The right hemisphere looks for patterns uh, as a, and, it, and it's you know, more integrated uh, than the left hemisphere, which tends to break things apart into chunks to see how it works. The right hemisphere is synthetic, the left hemisphere is analytic. And it would make sense that these kinds of things are analyzed um, in a synthetic kind of way. They're synthesized rather than analyzed. Uh, it goes a long way to explain why a pattern cannot be applied uh, in a new context. In a video that you'll see in a little bit, uh, Rod Ellis, whose uh, book you read the first three chapters of in, in the first three weeks of class, um, he talks about an experience he had working with a group of English language learners uh, and drill, he, where he had noticed that they were doing something that was not quite correct in English grammar. So he drilled and drilled and drilled it and they could do it all. They could all do it in the drill. But when it came time to not being in that controlled setting, they were unable to complete the task. Um, so Seliger recommended that inductive presentations were the right way to introduce something, but that they should then be followed up by deductive analysis. So you bring both sides of the brain to play uh, with the task. He didn't mean deductive the kind of way that the grammar translation folks would tell you, where you hand them a set of rules and tell them to go and drill them. No, he meant deductive in a very um, constructivist approach where you are presented with data that you analyze and figure out how it works. And that is really uh, very much uh, in line with cognitive code and also with uh, an approach to task-based learning that Rod Ellis promotes. He does say that this should be used primarily with more advanced learners for studying grammar, but he also realizes that it can be valuable even in the early stages of second language learning. Um, and this is using task, the task-based language learning approach uh, to grammatical materials. You're going to have the opportunity this week to, to play with that a little bit. Um, now, the way he assesses this is he uses a grammaticality test. A grammaticality test is where you give the learner examples of the item that you're studying, some that are correct and some that are incorrect, and the learner is asked to uh, figure out if it's correct and if it's not correct, why it's not correct. Uh, there's also a production test where learners are asked to produce uh, sentences using this particular kind of format. Um, 
those of you who were in my Hebrew 1 class will recognize, I think, uh, that this is the approach that you used when you were learning about noun adjective agreement. That's a really tough thing for native English speakers to master in Hebrew language because it works not only differently from English, but it's really complex uh, for a lot of different reasons. In, in English, you have one adjective that can be used with any noun in any form. Uh, you can talk about a green tree or many green trees. Uh, you can talk about, uh, oh, and the adjective always comes before the noun in English. This is not the case in Hebrew. The adjective tends to come after the noun. Uh, there are going to be four you know, different types of adjective forms, masculine, singular, feminine, singular, masculine, plural, feminine, plural. That's already complicated. You throw in numbers to the mix. Numbers are also adjectives. And it becomes yet more complicated because uh, one item the order of things gets reversed, right? You can talk about Sefer Gadol. You talk about one Sefer Gadol is Sefer Gadol Echad. Uh, it's very different. But when you have three big books, it's Shlosha Svarim Gdolim. The number comes first, the adjective at the end. Uh, with the number two, the form of the of the word changes. It's a very complicated set of uh, concepts and rules for a, a new language learner to juggle, which makes it ideal for this kind of intense and time-consuming activity. Uh, for that reason, I would reserve it for difficult concepts when you're talking about language learners um, adult language learners in particular. With children, it can be done a little bit more gently uh, using a very short kind of activity that just gives them a taste of how to understand it. Um, but it's a, it's a teaching method that, again, cannot be used, I don't think, as the entire approach, but it has some very, very rich elements to it. So with that, I will turn you over to the rest of the activities for this week.